Uh, the first is his experience of George Orwell's Wigan Pier, Road to Wigan Pier. Um, Peterson tells the story about how, as a teenager, he actually worked for the Alberta NDP as a social democratic party. And he says he was attracted by some of the members of the of the NDP, but others repelled him. And he had a kind of definitive moment when he wrote the, read The Road to Wigan Pier. He says, this book finally undermined me, not only my socialist ideology, but my faith in ideological stances themselves. In the famous essay concluding that book, written for and much to the dismay of the British Left Book Club, Orwell described the great flaw of socialism and the reason for its frequent failure to attract and maintain democratic power. Orwell said, essentially, that socialists did not really like the poor. They merely hated the rich. His idea struck home instantly. Socialist ideology served to mask resentment and hatred bred by failure. Many of the party activists I had encountered were using the ideals of social justice to rationalize their pursuit of personal revenge. In another speech, uh, he said that these middle class intellectual socialists didn't like the poor. They just hated the rich. And that's really different. That's seriously so different. It's a completely different set of motivations. There's a social justice warrior type who will be bleeding compassion all over you every step of the discussion, but the hatred for the rich, let's say, or for the successful, or for anybody who has any power or authority or standing of any sort, who's not at the absolute bottom of the dominance hierarchy. It has nothing to do with care for people at the bottom. And lastly, uh, it was about that time that I came across George Orwell's famous critique of left-wing thinking in the UK in a book called The Road to Wigan Pier, where he basically made the claim that the socialists he knew, especially the middle class ones, didn't give a damn about the poor, they just hated the rich. And that is something we're thinking about for a very long time because hatred turns out to be a very powerful motivation. You just don't get gulags out of benevolence. Now, I read The Road to Wigan Pier earlier this year, and Orwell does say that some socialists pay lip service about compassion for the poor, but don't actually want to be near them. Uh, he does say that some socialists come in talking about historical materialism and just confuse the living daylights out of everyone. Um, he doesn't actually say that socialists don't care about the poor, they just hate the rich. But there is a passage that looks kind of like it. But there are a few key differences, and they turn out to have some pretty serious implications, as we shall see. Um, here it is. On the other hand, it would be a mistake to regard the book-trained socialist as a bloodless creature entirely incapable of emotion. These are, these are intellectual academic socialists. Though seldom giving much evidence of affection for the exploited, he is perfectly capable of displaying hatred, a sort of queer theoretical in vacuo hatred against the exploiters. Not failures with a murderous spirit of revenge towards the successful, but academics with a strange kind of theoretical hatred of exploiters. How big of a difference does that make? Well, let's take a look at George Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier. Um, Orwell was writing about the unemployed and poor in a mining community called Wigan Pier in Britain. And uh, as you can see from the cover there, these were people who had a pretty tough row to hoe. And he takes a pretty anti-elitist stance on the impression these miners made on him. He says, it raises in you a momentary doubt about your own status as an intellectual and a superior person generally. For it is brought home to you, at least while you are watching, that it is only because miners sweat their guts out that superior persons remain superior. You and I and the editor of the Times Lit Sup and the poets and the Archbishop of Canterbury and Conrad X, author of Marxism for Infants, all of us really owe the comparative decency of our lives to poor drudges underground blackened to the eyes, with their throats full of coal and dust, driving their shovels forward with arms and belly muscles of steel. He says, despite the fact that we owe these people everything, they're living in unbelievably terrible conditions. They're exploited up the wazoo. And he goes through these conditions, which are really quite ghastly, uh, in excruciating detail, but he concludes that notes like these are only valuable as reminders to myself. Words are such feeble things. What use is a brief phrase like roof leaks? or four beds for eight people. This gives you a, an indication of, of the kind of life these people had. And he says, and all the while, anyone who uses his brains knows that socialism 
as a world system and wholeheartedly applied is a way out. Indeed, from one point of view, socialism is such elementary common sense that I am sometimes amazed that it has not established itself already. The world is a raft sailing through space with potentially plenty of provisions for everybody. The idea that we must all cooperate and see to it that everyone does his fair share of the work and gets his fair share of the provisions seems so blatantly obvious that one would say that no one could possibly fail to accept it unless he had some curious motive for clinging to the present system. And then he identifies the danger this, this book is trying to avoid. And again, you might not have understood this from Dr. Peterson's lectures. This is the danger. Yet the fact that we have got to face is that socialism is not establishing itself. At this moment, socialists almost everywhere are in retreat before the onslaught of fascism. And events are moving at a terrible speed. He says, when people are left in difficult circumstances and they don't get the socialism that they need, they turn fascist. And I should point out that he's writing this in 1937. Unless socialist doctrine in an effective form can be diffused widely and very quickly, there is no certainty that fascism will ever be overthrown. Uh, spoiler alert, people do not get socialism, they get the Second World War. What I am concerned with is the fact that socialism is losing ground exactly where it ought to be gaining it, the working class. This must be due chiefly to mistaken methods of propaganda as an image problem. It means that socialism in the form in which it is now presented to us has about it something inherently distasteful, something that drives away the very people who ought to be knocking to its support. Anything is relevant that helps make clear why socialism is not accepted. And please notice that I am arguing for socialism, not against it, but for the moment I am advocatus diaboli and speaking as the devil's advocate. He says these lines about socialists who give bad images to socialism. We have reached a stage where the very word socialism calls up, on the one hand, a picture of airplanes, tractors, and huge glittering factories of glass and concrete. On the other, a picture of vegetarians with wilting beards. Uh, I'm a vegetarian, but I can't clean up before this. Uh, of Bolshevik commissars, of earnest ladies in sandals, shock-headed Marxists chewing polysyllables, escaped Quakers, I don't know what that refers to, birth control fanatics, and Labour Party backstairs crawlers. Socialism, at least on this island, does not smell any longer of revolution and the overthrow of tyrants. It smells of crankishness machine worship and the stupid cult of Russia. Uh, people think of uh, confusing professors, Soviets and uh, social justice warriors, basically. And a lot of people don't see themselves in that and are not attracted to socialism as a result. Um, when he refers to the stupid cult of Russia here, we have to remember that the capitalist world had crashed into the Great Depression in 1929. Russia had had a pe peasant revolution in 1917 and at least appeared to be industrializing. So a lot of people but they were moving in the right direction while other parts of the world were moving in the wrong direction. And there were people praising it right through to uh, high ranking officials in the White House. But Orwell was one of the few people with the presence of mind to realize that it was not what it purported to be and that industrialization was not necessarily the same thing as progress, which is a good thing to keep in mind. Um, he says, all that is needed is to hammer two facts home into the public consciousness. One, that the interests of all exploited people are the same, the vast majority of people. The other, that socialism is compatible with human decency. And then this seems to be aimed directly at Jordan Peterson um, to recoil from socialism because so many socialists are inferior people is as absurd as refusing to travel by train because you dislike the ticket collector's face. Um, he concludes with, we have nothing to lose but our H's. It's a, a play on the famous phrase by Marx, we have nothing to lose but our chains. But here he's talking about the strange way that upper class British people pronounce words like wherefore and why. And he's saying you can't talk to people like that and convince them that the working class needs to be in charge. Um, that's George Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier. It's a very interesting book to read after 40 years of neoliberalism with the far right rising all around the world. I encourage people to read it. I doubt they will arrive at Jordan Peterson's understanding. The next is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn is perhaps Peterson's greatest hero. He lectures on him in his books extensively. He sells Alexander Solzhenitsyn t-shirts. Uh, Solzhenitsyn was a Russian writer who was thrown into the forced prison labor camps of the Soviet Union called the Gulag. And he was subjected to many crimes there and witnessed a great many more. Solzhenitsyn wrote uh, a great many different important books. He ultimately won the Nobel Prize but perhaps his most important work is the Gulag Archipelago, which is a 2,000-page account of the crimes of the Gulag, which 
many people around the world didn't know. It helped to, uh, its mass publication helped to end the stupid cult of Russia and ultimately played an important role in bringing down the Berlin Wall in 1989. Peterson says of Solzhenitsyn, to think this one guy, he's got numbers tattooed on his arm, he's as skinny as a rail, he's three quarters dead, and he's been beaten to death in 15 different ways. He decides under completely unreasonable circumstances that he's going to take personal responsibility for the circumstances that he happens to find himself in. The consequence of that, 25 years later, is that Solzhenitsyn's still around, but the Soviet Union isn't. And Peterson's going to use Solzhenitsyn both as an ideal to strive towards, and also in lecturing on the Gulag Archipelago, to warn us about what happens when a radical left-wing ideology, he's going to say this is uh, emblematic of the ideology of equity, uh, takes hold, and to bring us back to being non-ideological advocates for free market capitalism. Um, the problem is Solzhenitsyn in the 1990s wrote a, a very short book, can be quickly read, called The Russian Question. Uh, this is after the Soviet Union fell, and he was examining, he was zooming out the lens and looking at the context of Russian history, where Russia came from, where it is in the present moment, and the challenges the Russian people face moving forward. And he is not of the impression that the Soviet Union arose because a left-wing radical ideology permeated. Uh, on the contrary, he seems to see it as the inevitable consequence of the events that came before, namely the Tsars torturing the living daylights out of people for centuries, through serfdom, through throwing them into constant wars about issues they had that had nothing to do with their lives, uh, right into the 11th hour. And he says, when they finally emancipated the serfs, they did so with glaring mistakes. Land was partially left in the possession of the land owners, and only homesteads remained the private property of the peasants, they were required to buy out gentry land and had nowhere to turn to for this money, with his hand still tied by the, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce this, Obshachina, the stunned peasant, was thrown into the market, but now a new epoch thundered, the blow of the ruble, considerations of profit, and only profit, our patriarchal peasantry, already bucking under the many injustices of the reform, could not withstand this abrupt change. They took a disadvantaged class and threw them onto a competitive profit-maximizing market. And he says, indeed, all the consequences made themselves felt only in the 20th century. Then he goes through the Soviet Union, which he does indeed paint pretty darkly. He really did hate the Soviet Union, no doubt about that. Uh, then he moves on to free market capitalism, first in Russia and then around the world. Because when the Soviet Union fell, the first non-Soviet uh, president, Boris Yeltsin, in collusion with Western powers, especially the International Monetary Fund, quickly and undemocratically, rammed radical, libertarian, free market capitalism down the throats of the Russian people. Supposed to do great things, but it didn't exactly liberate the Russian people. And Solzhenitsyn goes full Solzhenitsyn on it. Here are some statistics now known worldwide. In 1993, deaths in Russia outnumbered births by 800,000. In 1993, there were 14.6 deaths for every 1,000 persons, a 20% increase over 1992. Reforms and 9.2 births, a 15% decline over one year. Precisely in these last two years, reforms, the suicide rate sharply increased, accounting for up to a third of all unnatural deaths. People have despaired and do not see why live, why give birth. We are dying out. Life expectancy for males has dropped to 60, on par with Bangladesh, Indonesia, and parts of Africa. The ruble-dollar blow of the 90s shook our character in yet a new way. Those who still preserved the kindly traits of a bygone time turned out to be the least prepared for the new way of life. Helpless, useless losers unable to feed their families and suffocating, doggled at the new breed, steamrolling over them with a new cry, booty, booty at any price, no matter if it's through fraud, rot, depravity, or the sale of material wealth. Booty became the new and now paltry capital I, ideology. That was free market capitalism. Uh, in the book's epilogue, which is Solzhenitsyn's presentation to the International Academy of Philosophy in Frankfurt, he warns that although the early ideal of socialism communism has collapsed, the problems which it purported to solve remain. The brazen use of social advantage and the inordinate power of money, which often direct the very course of events. And if the global lesson of the 20th century does not serve as a healing inoculation, then the vast red whirlwind may repeat itself in its entirety. This is how you create an authoritarian revolution. Unfortunately for Solzhenitsyn and the Russian people, uh, the worst was yet to come. In 1997, they had a bigger crash than the United States had in 1929. Uh, in 1999, Boris Yeltsin finally resigned with an apology for his naivete. 
ushering in the new authoritarianism of Vladimir Putin. And I'm afraid that over the last five years, each year the Russian people have voted Joseph Stalin as the greatest figure in history, followed by Vladimir Putin. That would sound impossible if you've just been watching Jordan Peterson's lectures, but it makes a great deal more sense if you understand the context, as Solzhenitsyn put it forward. Uh, he then talks about capitalism around the world. He says that it's alienating the mass of people, that it's pushing us over the cliff of a global environmental disaster. He thanks God the scientists have sounded the alarm and says we have to practice values of self-restraint and cooperation. He seems to be closer to George Monbiot or the degrowth movement than Jordan Peterson. Okay, now I'll accelerate a bit. Uh, Dr. Peterson often uses the gulag as a warning against what can happen under equity, which is equality of outcome. Uh, this is enormously misleading. The gulag was created by a man called Naftali Frankel, who was a businessman who was a little too, or a little too successful to remain inconspicuous and was thrown by the Soviet Union into their prisons. He then submitted an application claiming that he could turn those prisons into profit-making enterprises. So the Soviets took him out of the prisons and put him in charge of the first gulag expedition on the White Sea Canal. Frankel used methods to try and incentivize people to work harder, like rationing food according to productivity, which is why so many of the disabled prisoners starved to death. This, of course, was chronicled by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Uh, Peterson talks about the prison labor camps of Nazi Germany as arising out of just another radical ideology, again enormously incomplete. The Nazis were tremendously corporatist and used huge corporations like Krupp Enterprises, found guilty in the Nuremberg trials, which used largely Jewish forced labor to make Nazi weapons for profit. Um, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to go through American slavery, but as we come to the present era, when we look at prison labor today, we're again returning to the United States of America, which has more of its population incarcerated than any other country on earth. And they have a plethora of private prisons that each year rent out hundreds of thousands of prisoners as laborers to huge corporations like AT&T. This is the incarceration rate from 1978 to 2012. You can see the incarceration rate went up over 250%, even as the crime rate was going down. And at the risk of sounding like a social justice warrior, uh, those incarcerated are quite disproportionately black, Latino, and indigenous. It's a serious crisis of liberty. To the best of my knowledge, Dr. Peterson has never addressed it. Uh, here he's speaking at the Manning Institute, a conservative think tank in Canada. And he's saying, he's talking about the postmodern neo-Marxists. He says, the problem is they don't have a shred of gratitude. They have no gratitude. And he says, you know, the black community in the United States is the 18th wealthiest nation on the planet. Now that doesn't mean there isn't such a thing as relative poverty and relative poverty matters. It's an important political economic issue and it's very, very difficult to deal with, but absolute wealth matters too. And Western societies have been absolutely remarkable in their ability to generate and distribute wealth. Um, it's true that African-Americans made significant gains in the mid 20th century. However, the story has been a bit different in the neoliberal era a study from the Institute for Policy Studies released last year showed that between 1983 and 2013, median African-American wealth, household wealth, declined by 75 percent uh, and Latino wealth declined by 50 percent. They estimate that by the year 2053, if things continue as they're going, median African-American wealth will be zero. Uh, gratitude does not appear to be either the reasonable nor the practical response to the current conditions. Um, quite significant economic change would seem to be the very necessary response. I think good old Bernie would have put the policies that ruined Venezuela into operation in the U.S. The problem here is basically American history. In the 19th and early 20th century, the exploitation, there was a lot of right-wing capitalism at that time, uh, but the exploitation and the working conditions were so terrible and the constant economic crashes were so frequent, culminating, of course, in the Great Depression, that America kept getting pushed closer and closer to the brink of full-scale revolution. So by the mid-20th century, the spectrum had swung so far to the left that Republicans had an upper tax bracket of 92% on the super rich to pay for New Deal social programs and supported unions. Uh, this, of course, is the era that's often referred to as the Great Prosperity, the 1940s to the 1970s. Um, what's really interesting is not just how far to the left they went, but the rhetoric. This is Dwight Eisenhower, Republican president, and you can see him saying that those who don't support the New Deal and don't support workers joining the union of their choice are part of a tiny splinter group, a bunch of fools who take us back to the days when labor was an almost 
helpless mass. Um, that was not the radical left. That was mainstream conservative opinion in the most capitalist country in history. Uh, that was twice elected Republican President Dwight Eisenhower. Now, in the 1970s, there was inflation. Uh, this was used as the excuse to bring in the right-wing capitalists and institute neoliberalism. Trends have been a bit different since then. Uh, this is a report to the United States Congress, not a, a uh, left-wing rag, uh, chronicling household wealth from 1989 to 2013, a quarter century. If you look at that top section there in the light gray, you can see that's the top 10%, and they start out pretty well. Uh, $30 trillion in 1989. You can see them coming down a bit in the early 90s. That's the recession of George H.W. Bush, but they rebound pretty quickly, crash a bit again in the Great Depression, or Great Recession, sorry. But then they bounce back up and they go from 30 trillion to 65 trillion in wealth uh, in a 25 year span. And that next line that you see underneath there, that's the next 40% of the population. And you can see they start at $12 trillion and they get to a peak of 16 trillion. Then they crash in the Great Recession down to 14 trillion and then they stay there. That's your angry white working class voting. Um, they're pretty well off, actually, but they've stopped getting anywhere and they're getting very frustrated about that. If you look carefully, there's a dark line that goes across the bottom there. Um, don't be deceived by how small it is. That's five times the population is the top line. Uh, that's the bottom 50 percent of America. They start with about a trillion dollars in 1989. And they go up, if you look carefully, they do actually go up. They hit a peak of about $1.3 trillion. Then they crash down to about $800 billion in the Great Recession, and then they stay there. And of course, the population was steadily increasing that entire time. So the bottom 50% actually lost about 30% of their per capita wealth over that quarter century. And the bottom 90% uh, were completely stagnant. So I leave it to you to decide where the threats lie. Um, these people are anti-capitalist on their iPhones. You don't get to do that. It's a performative contradiction. Uh, I'll leave aside for a moment the fact that this would make anyone who uses a library or a public road a communist. Um, in the book, The Entrepreneurial State, there's an entire chapter devoted to the state behind the iPhone. That's a chap the title of the chapter. And it goes through how Apple actually doesn't really invent these things. They package them as commodities. But uh, virtually every single aspect of your iPhone was created through publicly funded, taxpayer funded research and development. And that's true of pretty much the entire uh, high tech economy, as well as the majority of our basic medical research, the Internet, the computer, satellite technology, man on the moon, vaccines, touchscreen technology, Siri, the GPS, drone technology, the Google algorithm. Uh, these were all created through years, often decades of publicly funded research and development which caused the book to conclude that the risks relating to innovation are socialized, but the rewards are privatized. Um, Dr. Peterson's own field of psychology does not appear to be particularly kind to either right-wing capitalism or consumer culture or to extreme inequality in particular. Um, the, uh, in the neoliberal age, the most right-wing countries, especially the United States of America, have seen uh, depression and suicide, especially among the young, explode while the country is reporting the highest levels of happiness, life satisfaction, well-being, and flourishing are pretty consistently in the social democracies of Scandinavia. The Pennsylvania Amish report life satisfaction on par with the richest Americans, Forbes' richest Americans, while there's no discernible correlation beyond middle-class income when people are pretty secure between financial well-being and day-to-day -day happiness causing Dr. Dr. Martin Seligman to observe that life satisfaction in the United States has been flat for 50 years, even though the GDP has tripled, where the great Dr. Daniel Kahneman concludes that money does not buy you experiential happiness, but poverty certainly buys you misery. And it's pretty hard to pull a theory and an argument for right-wing capitalism out of the findings of contemporary psychology. Um, now, I was not able to find anything in which Dr. Peterson directly addressed this. And that's not to say it doesn't exist. He has hundreds of hours of YouTube content. He's always releasing more. And I just wasn't able to find it. it that might be me getting lost in the myriad. Um, but he does give a number of speeches in which he tries to persuade people away from considering happiness as a dominant pursuit. And he says this. 
Um, you hear these dough-headed, and that's a very minor word. People who are always pushing happiness as the key measure for successful existence. It's so ill-informed that it's embarrassing that it happens. Positive emotion makes people impulsive. Maniacs, for example. If you're manic, you're one happy person. Way too happy. Uh, which is true. If people were to reduce the criteria to just some intense feeling of positive emotion, uh, there'd be a problem here. Um, but it doesn't have much in particular to do with Denmark, nor does it have anything to do with how uh, psychologists create constructs for positive psychology. So it's not really what people have been talking about. Um, perhaps he addresses this better in some other speeches. I will be skeptical about what I'm presenting here because just because I couldn't find it doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily exist. Um, but it certainly causes, psychology certainly causes some problems for Dr. Peterson's worldview. Here's a big one. Dr. Peterson often says that despite all the grievances that are aired about neoliberalism, uh, around the world, extreme poverty is rapidly declining, so it can't be that bad. Now, he does in one interview admit that a part of this has entailed some wealth from the wealthier countries going to the poorer countries, and that can upset some people. Uh, but this is enormously misleading. It's been the wealth, quite specifically the working class in the wealthy countries, going to overwhelmingly the People's Republic of China to maximize overwhelmingly American corporate profits, which is perhaps not the best argument for individualism. Uh, but as we see here, we've got the trends in poverty and extreme poverty around the world, poverty across the top, uh, extreme poverty in the red underneath it, and a more recent measurement in black at the end there. Uh, you can see that they've been going down and at an accelerating rate for 200 years through many different systems, including the welfare states and social democracies of the mid 20th century, at which point, uh, global GDP growth was actually considerably higher than it's been in recent decades. Uh, but you will notice one exception. If you look about two thirds of the way in, you'll see that the rate of uh, poverty declining starts to stagnate and extreme poverty stagnates almost completely. Um, that was when the extreme right wing capitalism of the 1920s, often called the Gilded Age, crashed headfirst into the Great Depression and took a wrecking ball through the global economy. So do the trends in extreme poverty around the world justify a system? I don't think so. Do they tell us to go further to the right? I don't think so. Do they tell us to be quite wary of going to the right? I think fairly emphatically. Uh, even Jordan Peterson's pet topic, that radical postmodern neo-Marxism has been taking over the universities, uh, it's rather misleading when we think of what's actually been going on in the university structurally. Um, Let's assume for a moment that postmodernism really is as terrible as Peterson purports. A big assumption, but let's go with it. We'd still have to explain how a philosophy so radical and so terrible could exponentially expand through the university systems in recent decades. How could that have possibly been allowed? And at least part of the answer is far from being way too radical. Uh, the postmodernists have not rocked the boat. They haven't resisted a mosquito bite in 40 years. Uh, structurally, the universities haven't moved one iota to the left. They've moved way to the right and become enormously corporatized. Of course, you all know that because you've seen what's happened uh, to your tuition. Here's from the uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, inflation as it pertains to different items from 1978 to 2010. There across the bottom in the light blue, you see wages. Uh, going up in the dark to the top there, that's tuition up at over a thousand percent and up over 800 percent underneath there. That's your, your textbooks and school supplies. Uh, not exactly the trends of radical left-wingism. Uh, maybe a little left-wingism could have been useful there. So this is why the universities have been pumping money into administration and building huge schools of finance. They've not been moving to the left. Uh, I could go through a whole bunch of other issues, but I'm sure you get the point. Dr. Peterson is not so much a liar as he is a lawyer, a systematic devil quoting scripture, who takes sources with information and ideas that we desperately need to know. We badly need to know this stuff. And he leaves people with the most opposite possible impression of what they contain. We have to progress this conversation because the things that are starting to give us problems right now, global corporate domination, the greatest inequality and worker precarity in a century, and a looming environmental disaster, they're not just expected to continue in the upcoming years, they're expected to accelerate. And I do think that polarization is a huge problem. And I do think that the potential for an authoritarian violent outcome is very real, but not because of some conspiracy theory, 
for the simple parsimonious reasons given by people like George Orwell, that if we fail to actually address the issues and allow a terrible status quo to fester, it can reach a breaking point.